Welcome back to another Ben McGreevy Sports Podcast. And uh, today we have a huge, huge show for you. We start out by talking about the huge nature of Alexander Ovechkin's 800 goals. We then move in to the Edmonton Oilers. And we honestly spend a lot of time talking about the Oilers. McDavid, Dreisaitl, why are they not winning more? What's the issue there? You have the two best players in the world. Besides Nashville, it's, you're struggling in games. What's the problem in Edmonton? And then we move into the Nashville Predators, and we sit on the Preds for a long time because that's who we're fans of. That's who we love to watch. And what is wrong in Nashville? Why can't they win a game and what needs to change? And then we answer your Twitter questions. And you had some good ones for us, and we love getting those questions. So be sure to send them our way. So let's get started on the Ben McGreevy Sports Podcast. All righty. So we're going to go ahead and, and hop right in here. This is, is we have a loaded, loaded show today. We had a bunch of Twitter questions come in. We had... Uh, we had a lot of you who had a lot of different things that you wanted us to talk about. Plus we felt like there were some major things around the NHL that we needed to just briefly hit on on like, Hey, here's what's happening around the league. And then we're going to get into a little bit of the Nashville. And I say a little bit, the Nashville predators are, uh, have lost five in a row and do six in a row, right? Six in yeah, a row six. and do not look good. Um, and so we're going to walk through and touch on that later, but we're going to start out with NHL stuff first and bringing, uh, the, the crew together today, who we have here talking with us, uh, on trying to make sure that this podcast is the best it can be. We have Heath green Heath. How you doing right now? Pretty good. Pretty good. Good to be back. Nice. Nice. You've been busy uh, with work recently, but, uh, have you gotten to watch much hockey at all? trying to think i think yeah i have um kind of a lot of the the flights are late right now so off and on love it love it well it's actually been a really good couple weeks for hockey like i've really enjoyed a lot of the stuff that's like a lot of the games that have been on and a lot of the teams are doing cool stuff and and things like that so it's been a good time to watch hockey uh for sure yeah oh yeah well, I wanted us to, and, and I've mentioned this right off the top, but like, we're going to get into a little bit of the NHL stuff first, like overall. And, uh, and the first one I want to get to is Alexander Ovechkin. He has scored 800 goals, 800 goals. Um, this is a huge milestone in NHL history, only two guys ever before Alexander Ovechkin had reached that 800 goal mark. It was Wayne Gretzky and Gordie Howe, literally Mr. Hockey and the great one. Um, and so what we're sitting here looking at is Alex Ovechkin just probably became, uh, based on era adjustments and things like that, the greatest goal scorer to have ever played the game. Um, he did it with a hat trick against Chicago. He, what does this, did this mean something to you? Or was it just like, wow, Ovechkin's a good player. What kind of did Ovechkin getting 800 mean to you? I don't think I could watch this game. I think what night was that Tuesday or something maybe, but anyway, yeah. it, I think it was, an, yeah, I think it was Tuesday night, which I was flying, but I read about it. It was one of those, you know, it's one of those things you hate to say it, you kind of don't realize it was that close to happening because you know we don't we don't pay attention or at least I don't um as closely to the Washington Capitals as uh if I had more time maybe I would have but maybe not but no this is a it's a really long, it's a big milestone for him and for I think for the league for somebody in this you know the, the way the NHL is has evolved over the last I don't know 20 years or so I mean they haven't seen a player like Ovechkin that can score consistently every night or every other night um, and putting up 800 goals. I mean, with the two of the best hockey players that's played in the NHL, Wayne Gretzky and Gordie Howe. I mean, that's company that you almost after, you know, the, you know, nineties when goaltending was kind of just, you know, all over the place, you'd probably see four or five goals a night to when it went down, you know, two or three goals a night, maybe one. 
Um, he came in and he, in his first season, I think he had over a hundred points. So this is a, this is a guy that's just blown everybody's minds ever since he came into the league. So I think it's a great, a great milestone for him. I, I totally agree. It puts him, he's 94 away from the record. Yeah. Uh, and if you look at what Alex Ovechkin is on pace to do this year, it's ridiculous. I mean, he's on yeah. pace essentially for another 50 goal season and he's, he's what, 35 years old. And Yeah. That's what I wanted to say too. I mean, he, even though he's getting older, honestly, he's, he's kind of like the auger. He's getting older, but he's really isn't changing <laughs> his, his style of play isn't changing. He has, you know, and I think the thing with him is he's very serious, but he has a lot of fun while he's doing it too. He has a he loves hockey, um, and he loves the NHL. So I think for him, I think it that's how he can do this so easily. He's not so caught up in you know being serious all the time. He he likes to go out and have fun and compete. So I I totally agree, and I think this meant something for me as well in some ways because it makes you realize like there are some of these records that just seem almost untouchable, you know, like, and, and even, even though uh, he's getting up there towards like the Gretzky goal record, you know, we all sit here and say, no one's touching Gretzky's 2,857 points. You know, that, that sounds ridiculous, but I would say this in 2004, no, no, no. I'm going to say in 2010, 2015, no one thought that anyone would even touch Gretzky's goal record. Right. And here we are. And I think that what this has done, I think it's exciting for the league to know that even though there has been the greatest players ever played in Wayne Gretzky, uh, there's someone out there who is going to eventually be able to do it. And it might be in 50 years, but right. Ovechkin is proving to me that it can be done. And and as long as there's a record to be broken, somebody's going to try to break the record. And yeah. that that's why I thought this meant something. Um, it's such a, it's history. You know, I think uh, ESPN, the chase to 800 mm-hmm. was a huge marketing thing. And it, it, if he is able to continuously score goals, if he scores another 25 this year and then can do 40 after that, uh, you're sitting there and and imagine the imagine the ticket price when he is a goal away or right. two or three goals. You know, you got a hat trick to hit yeah, 100. That's, when you yeah. get down to like three goals away, I mean, everyone wants to be there just to maybe see it. I yeah. think. And so that that's really this means something because it shows that there's still the opportunity to get there. And I, I think that that is pretty neat. Yeah. Yeah, I think so too, especially in the, the the age that we are in the NHL at this point. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Now, from one great goal scorer to another great goal scorer and point getter, we're gonna move on to Connor McDavid and Leon Drysital as a part of the Edmonton Oilers. Now, if you saw, if if you know, if you're watching this on YouTube and watch this YouTube channel frequently, uh, we went to the game on. Uh, Tuesday, where Edmonton was in town against Nashville. The big two, as in McDavid and Dreisaitl, are by far the most fun tandem to watch, maybe in sports right now. When they're out there, it's easy for them. They score what seems like at will, especially against Nashville. Uh, these guys are on pace. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pull this up right now. Right now, McDavid has 62 points, and Dreisaitl has 54 points. And the Oilers have only played what I believe is, as I pull this up, 31 games. Okay? 32 games, I'm sorry. When you put those numbers together, you are almost averaging for McDavid two points a game, and you are are close to that with Dreisaitl as well. Why are the Edmonton Oilers not winning more? They're sitting in a wild card spot right now. They're in the the number one wild card spot. But let's we all we're about to complain about Nashville for a little while. Nashville has three games in hand on Edmonton. If they won all three, they would only be one point back on the two best hockey players in the world, uh, arguably. What's wrong with the Oilers? Why are they not winning more? 
I think recently their defense has just been – I think they played the Ducks last night. Um, senseless turnovers. Um, Darnell Nurse hasn't had a, a great season in terms of uh, – at least in, as of late. Um, and He's I think the – paid. Yeah, he is. And – uh they're, they're just really bad turnovers i mean bouchard had a really bad turnover yesterday or last night um whenever that well, yeah saturday was yesterday i i don't remember days anymore so um but yeah i mean i think their defense and, and it's not helping their goaltending isn't i mean their goaltending is fine i think they're just not getting much help on the back on the defensive side of the puck and you can only rely on you know how long can they ride dry side on mcdavid the entire season you know, can they ride them the entire season and, and have them put up? And then you probably, obviously, you can count on a little bit of some uh, R and H in there, so Nugent Hopkins and whatnot to score. But I mean, if you're going to rely on McDavid and Drysdale really to, you know, score most of your goals, come you know seventy games or so, are they going to be able to produce at that same level? And, and that to me is a really good question uh, because you are sitting there and looking at at that team and saying it is just two guys. Um, I, I, I struggle with that. Uh, obviously, I think that there's a, you know, I think that's legitimate in a lot of ways, but I also look at their roster and I don't necessarily look at it and think, mm, that team is just atrocious. You know, like. No, like, they're not bad. I mean, like, they've got Zach, Zach Hyman's very good too. Absolutely. <laughs> And and Zach Hyman has had the literally luckiest career ever where he's playing with Austin Matthews. And when he goes somewhere else, he's playing with Connor McDavid. Did, like, did, how about a lucky career? Did he score a hat trick the other night against Nashville? I didn't get to he watch did. the game. Yep, yep. He he was a hat trick scorer. So, yeah, he got the hat trick. Uh, and he was the – he did not have the most points on the team. That's ridiculous. Um <laughs> Uh, Yessi Pugliarvi, for example, is on that team. Yeah. He should be so much better than he yeah. is, but he has like one goal and five assists. Um, I, I just wonder, like, with some of the Oilers' struggles, and and this is something that I, I've been really, really wondering, uh, is is it in Edmonton a coach problem? Uh, is it a Jay Woodcroft problem? Now, let me, I obviously. Don't like before, before we attack that and rake it through the mud, I just wonder if they should be winning more with the roster they have and they aren't for some reason. And it's not helping that, that Jack Campbell and Stuart Skinner have both been uh, pretty bad this year. Um, Skinner's been way better than Jack Campbell. Uh, Campbell's at an eight, seven, five save percentage. So that doesn't help, but I noticed the coaching mindset on Tuesday night, watching it in person. And I was sitting there and I was saying, this is weird what the Oilers were doing. Like, for example, Nashville scored a minute and a half into the game. Cody Glass shot it. It was a probably a bad goal for Campbell to let in, honestly. And so, like, they, they score immediately. For the next six minutes of the game, McDavid and Dreisaitl were in. And, and I, I mean, maybe they took two minutes off, but like four of the next six minutes, it was McDavid and Drysaddle, McDavid and Drysaddle, McDavid and Drysaddle, Hyman scores, McDavid and Drysaddle don't touch the ice again for like five minutes. And I was sitting there and I was, I was thinking and processing that. And I thought, man, I understand that McDavid and Drysaddle are going to score more easily than other guys, but, but is that making your team so reliant on two guys like like your system doesn't matter uh, because they're always going to score so like you look at the rest of their team you don't have a great system and maybe your your players can play a little bit lazy I'm not saying that that's McDavid and Drysaddle's fault I'm wondering if it's a system's fault to get guys to wake up and play when they have to play with McDavid and Drysaddle what do you what you think that theory is decent or do you think it's pretty pathetic and it's just a depth issue? Yeah, I mean, I think that uh, that makes a lot of sense. I always say I wasn't at the game against the Oilers, but 
now that you mention that, I mean, it, it sounds like he doesn't know how to get, like you're saying, get those players to kind of figure out and activate in a system that allows them to produce other than the two star players on their team. And if it, if you're going to, you know, it almost sounds like he's, he's looking for an answer, you know, immediately, which granted you would want that answer back with a goal quickly, but at the same time, you've got the, I mean, that was within the first, it was within the first, what, five minutes that Nashville had scored. It was pretty quick. Um, I I think I got the notification and it it seems like from what it sounds like that he just doesn't know how to get these guys to actually, you know, work together other than just two players that easily can score a goal on almost any team in the league. Um, So yeah, it it could be a, a, a coaching issue. And I just wonder like, like if John Cooper was the head coach of the Edmonton Oilers, how many Stanley cups have they won by now? Oh man. And see, you've got to find a way. I think almost, you don't want to split McDavid and dry sidle up, but you've got to find a way to almost, you know, share the, the amount of production they're getting out of those two. Can you have them on different lines and still produce at the level with different players too? Can you kind of expand on what you have? Um, and I, I, if, if they're going to play six minutes, you know, or four out of the first, you know, that six minute span and then not play again, does that tell you that they're looking for something and if they don't like it, then well, I guess you're going to sit for a little bit and, you know, we're just going to kind of sit back and wait for another chance to try to, get another goal yeah and, and so i don't know it, it, it is interesting i don't know i i really struggle with with why they're not winning more and um and I, the guy i had with me on on tuesday night for the game he's he's a big sports fan had only been to a few games and i was on the way you know he was like i know mcdavid and dry are good tell me a little bit about the oilers and i was like well man like, honestly, like, they should be good. And he was like, so they're not dominating the league with the two best players in the league? And I was like, well, no. Like, and, and it, they should be. And that's when he said that, I was like, why aren't they? You know, that's a little bit silly. Um, and, and they should be winning easily. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about, in just a little bit, a Twitter question came in about, like, buyer sellers at the deadline. And I want to talk. I'm going to come back to Edmonton on that. Um, but. We're talking about this with the Oilers. One thing that we do know as a fact is uh, we're recording this on Monday, uh, on Sunday. On Monday, the Oilers are going to take the Nashville Predators to the woodshed and beat them senseless. All right. That's, that is exactly how it happens every single game. And so, speaking of the Nashville Predators, they are coming into that game on a six game losing streak. Uh, if you look at their schedule, they have lost games to the uh, Tampa Bay Lightning, got blown out. They lost a game to Ottawa, one of the worst teams in the NHL. They then lost one to nothing to St. Louis. They then lost badly six to three to the Oilers. They then lost two to one to the Jets in a game that should not have been two to one. UC Soros was spectacular in that game. And then they lost uh, three to one. One goal was an empty net. They lost, lost three to one to Colorado. Once again, UC Soros spectacular in that, uh, in that game. That is six games in a row. Who's at fault here? Why why are they losing so many games uh, with the roster they have? I I think this is a everybody problem, but um, let's let's talk about. I, it. I think I think I want to. I, I mean, at some point, let's say it's let's say it's realistically, it's probably. It, it, I think it's a GM and coaching issue right now, especially coaching. Um, but you know. Eventually, I think you've got to come out of – the players have to say, look, I mean, you know, they're, they're in this awful, awful, I mean, awful rut that 
eventually you have to find a way out of it. I mean, yeah, you can coach as much as you want. You can trade as many players as you want, but at the end of the day, players like Roman Yossi and Ekholm have been there for a while and Johansson um, have to step up and, and, and I, and, and that's not to profess or say anything about Yossi. I mean, he's had a decent, what, like 22 games or so. He's had 19 or so points in the last 20 or so games. Yeah. He has 23 um, points in 29 games, which I mean, for a defenseman is pretty good. He's definitely in the top. I think he's in the top seven in the league. So, but uh, you know, I don't, they're obviously injured too on the defensive side of the puck, which doesn't help, but the turnovers are just senseless again. I think we saw it last night. Um, and they just don't, I think it, it's, it comes down to everybody. I mean, even the players, they have to find a way to score some goals and help their goaltender out. Cause right now, I mean, they're, they're essentially relying on their goalies to keep them in games and that's not going to happen. You get 40 games into a season, 50, and the goalies are dead. They are – they their, their goal differential is negative 18, by the way. Yeah. It, and it, I think it, the highest it got was like minus – or lowest, I should say, would have been – I think it was like minus seven at one point up until the six-game losing streak. So that, that was the best they had got was minus seven. I think they, they obviously had a positive up until the – after the global series, but – they they have a lot of issues and I don't know if they're going to be able to sort them out, but I think it does stem from coaching, but uh, uh, he, here's the thing that I'm really struggling with a lot with this group. If I went down the list and said, okay, I'm going to give you a team. I'm going to give you Philip Forsberg. I'm going to give you Matt Duchesne. I'm going to give you Mikhail Granlund. I'm going to give you Nino Niederreiter. I'm going to give you Ryan Johansson. I'm going to give you Roman Yossi, Ryan McDonough, Matthias Ekholm, and UC Saros. What do you expect out of that team? They should be good. I mean, they should be winning hockey games with that this team. Is, this is where I, I struggle. The players have proven talent, you know? Yeah. Like, like the players have shown that they can play in the NHL and score in the NHL and be successful in the NHL. And it's not like they don't want to win anymore. It's not like they're bored. Right. But when you watch them, it looks like they don't even know how to play hockey. No. And like, at some point, do you just call that you're not – you just don't buy into the system that's being coached anymore? Maybe I, I like, I, there was such an interesting moment in the Colorado game where uh, we're like gross passed it to somebody. It was like oh, a nifty you, little you, pass. You, you, mm -hmm. Do you know what I'm talking about? Like, is this like a the little, turnover? Or no, is this no, 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 no. I, I'm talking like, it was actually a good play. Like it was like a nice little feed behind his back to somebody. And then they fed it to someone else and, and oh, yeah. they got a nice little yeah, shot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was like, what 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 that was the first time i've watched him make a hockey play in how many games yeah. like the goals they're scoring currently are not good you know what i mean like it's like like ryan johansson scored on a one-timer against edmonton and it was like he kind of whiffed on the shot and jack campbell should have never let it in right. and like cody glass's shot that he scored against edmonton was like tipped in front like none of their their goals all look accidental and, and yeah. i'm sitting here and it was like that was the first hockey play I've seen the team make in a long time. That is not a player issue when the entire coach's mantra is we've got to play a system. And the guy who I was with, you know, not of hockey knowledge, he said, man, why do they just keep dumping it in? Why just That's every night in? too. All it's, night. It's what they, it's the only thing they do. I just named players that have every ability to carry the puck in you know, the zone. You know, what's sad. You put them on, you give them, like you, you mentioned John Cooper, you give them John Cooper and this team's winning hockey games. I you've mean, got goaltending, you've got the players and I, you know, obviously the players have to show You're right. It's an everyone issue. Like, like the players have to show up and play. Right. And, but at the end of the day, 
or do they actually want to show up and play for a guy that has a system that doesn't work anymore? And, it's, and I that's... think that what we may we be what we're seeing now is I mean they don't even I mean they look so bad. I, they it, there was a play last night. Man, was it gross with the terrible turnover on the half boards in the defensive zone in like the first period? It ended up leading to a it's almost a breakaway, but it was right in the slot there. I was but on I the mean, radio. It, I was listening on the oh, radio you're on the for right. the first period. Yeah, I forgot who had who had turned it over. But they have so many turnovers a game in the defense. Then and, and and we point this out every every game they do this. But you know they they regain possession right and they go for a change, and Ekholm just skates it to the to the neutral zone. Doesn't get the ice. Throws it in the defense or the offensive zone, and they get off the ice and lose possession and skate right back. And then they do the same thing. It's just the dump and chase, dump and chase, and they never get the puck. Their power play oh my. is 0 for 20 in the last 20 attempts. Yeah. That is, they, they said this on the radio last night. Uh, they have 40 minutes of ice time with a man advantage and have not scored. Two full periods with at least an extra guy in the ice. That's a serious issue. And they have not scored. I mean, they they are 31st in the league in power play percentage, just above the Montreal Canadiens. Boy, Montreal, how many is that? You're looking at the stats. What is attempts on that? Uh, let's see here, Montreal. Because I, I, I feel like Nashville's had a ton of attempts and just hasn't been able to capitalize. Also, Montreal does not have the skill. I don't. I would say that I like the the proven scoring. So one one hundred opportunities on the power play for Montreal, one hundred and four for Nashville. So it's really that they're they're still pretty bad. You they're, know, like, they're they're pretty much right in line with each other. One okay. Nashville's got fifteen goals and Montreal has fourteen. So, well, uh, and see, I, you look at all that, and that is once again just but, you know who you're in you're in territory of the columbus blue jackets the anaheim ducks are better on the power play the philadelphia flyers who start out the season high and then they've just fallen off um you know and with this roster that is just atrocious they stand around that as they they don't move that's all they do and they've got to create space when they don't have space they've got to find a way to create space and they keep everything to perimeter and they just get lousy shots when I, it was amazing to watch the Oilers power play the other night. Cause I was like, they don't stand still. It's a no. constant rotation. There's not a single guy that stood still and, uh, and they scored consistently, you know, and that, that is exactly once again, the player should know better, yeah. but if they're being instructed to do something by a coaching staff, you know, like, like the coaching staff has the ability to look at that and say, they got to move their feet. Boys, we're going to move our feet. And the players got to go out and move their feet. But guess what? I don't think the coaches are sitting there saying, boys, move your feet. Because there's no change at all. Well, you, you know, it's, it, it, it bothered me last night. It's the same. I think I texted you all about this, too. It's the same message between every period. They go there. They do their little coach interview. And all they say is, well, we got to get pucks in the offensive zone. Well, we've got to get better shots. Okay, cool. I'm glad you stated the obvious. So how are you gonna how are you gonna fix that? You're gonna do nothing to fix that. It's the same exact. It's what is it? Insanity attempting the same thing over and over and over and yep. just getting the same result of failure this time. I mean, it's ridiculous. Yeah, it's 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 not a good look. Okay, the, the, we talked a lot about coaching. Players are driving us crazy because they're not scoring. Um, Dutchie had a pretty goal last night where he waited. He was so patient with it and just sniped it. Let's go to management a little bit. Uh, I want us to talk about Ellie Tolvanen. Um, we're not going to spend a ton of time on Tolvanen, but I want us to touch on him a little bit. He gets placed on waivers and gets claimed by the Seattle Kraken. Now they said that this is a numbers game. Well, we needed to call up some defensemen. We needed to do this. We needed to do that. So we just had to do what we had to do. What on earth? And, and we let's talk about this. 
Tolvin hasn't been the best player in Nashville. But it's not like the skill set isn't there. So there, there's a problem with development. We're going to get uh, Josh Kirby asked a question on or a question on Twitter, and we're going to make it a part of the segment talking about the Preds because it directly applies. Hines isn't developing talent. That's a problem. But you let a guy like Ellie Tolvin and walk while you have guys like Cole Smith and Mark Jankowski sitting on the roster. And you call up AHL players. What's happening? What's going through their minds? Why is this acceptable? Why is no one being held accountable for it? What is your take on the Tolvanen situation? Honestly, I was pretty speechless when it happened. I mean, you, I get it. He he hasn't produced, especially this season. He hasn't performed. Even when he came into the league, he's been just kind of up and down between Milwaukee and Nashville. Finally got his spot in Nashville and just still – you know, we kind of thought he he may do something when when Evan Hines came in. He he kind of produced a little bit, but he never. And I say a little bit. I mean, a very bare minimum. Um, and you saw you you would see flashes of what people had spoken about when uh, when he was younger, and and you know he just he didn't produce and perform. But at the same time, it seems like. You've got to you've got to find a way to um, what's the word I'm looking for? I had mentioned it the other day, but uh, you know, create these or make these players better when they get over here. And and I don't I feel like every time John Hines gets a guy that's younger, and you would think he would are developing in these players, and you would think with his background he'd be able to, but it seems like they just can't. Um, and this is a kid who's who's really good. I think he has a potential to be very, very good. He just they didn't pro- he didn't produce and they didn't develop him well enough. And I guess they felt like the need to go ahead and wave him and see what happens. It it is a sad thing because I was sitting here thinking about this, like why why the need to wave a player when like they need a defenseman, right? You're so beat up already. Throw Tolvin in on the point and let him play a third line D pairing. Yeah. Like at what point is he going to be that much worse than calling up a 29 year old from the AHL? You know what I mean? Like, like yeah. that, that's something I struggled with is like, you're going to lose a guy to just put a position guy in there when you know that in the next like three or four games, you're going to get some defensemen back. What is that? Why is that a decision? You have Philip Tomasino sitting in the minors. You have Tolvin and up here failing. You, you're not developing any talent when you hired a coach whose point was, let's actually, let's get to the tweet. Josh Kirby had a great tweet. Uh, he said, uh, question for you, with, with how this season for the Preds is going, inconsistent play, poor goalie play. Now, I will say this, this was uh, last week. So, SARS has obviously really improved. Uh, but he said not all his fault due to the first point. Tolby and youth not developing so valid um, like they should. And he put in parentheses Hines. If you fire David Poyle, who do you replace him with? It has to be or it needs to be an outside voice. Who um, are you looking to make a general manager change at this point? I think you have to. Because I don't think I hate to say it. At the same time, I think you've got to almost change. You've got to change the I think they're going to have to change the general manager if their goal is to find a different coaching staff at the end of the day. I don't know if David Poyle will let go of John Hines. And that's not saying he needs to let go of him. He, he didn't. I mean, we this team's probably not going to make playoffs. Let's just be realistic. I'm not saying they have to let him go now. And maybe he turns the season around. I don't know. They seem to do that every year, halfway through the season. But I do think he's run his course in Nashville. And I think he's a great general manager, especially for a franchise starting out in the league. He can get you on the map. But in his time as a general manager in Nashville, he's almost had 25 seasons at this point. And they've been to the Stanley Cup final once. They have been. The uh, the average hockey team that makes it into the playoffs every year almost 
and loses in six or so games in the first round. Maybe every two or three years they'll squeak into the second round. Then they'd go lose in six games again. And then once every, what, 15 years? Mate, we haven't seen 30 years yet in Nashville, but every 15 we can just say they may make the Stanley Cup final. Maybe. But no Stanley Cups in 25 years in one final appearance. And not and 90 percent of those playoffs ends in a six game first round exit. It's it's ugly. And uh and to me, I I say it, I, I think it's time as well. He, here's the struggle for me is um I think you have to make the decision right now if you think you're gonna make playoffs. And and like he, here's I think yeah. the discussion. By the way, I want to get to Josh said, who would you hire? We're going to get to that in a second. I think that for, for Poyle, the management has to sit here and look at this and say, okay. And, and I, I, it's, it's a terrible thing to compare it to, but look at St. Louis in 2019, right? They had the roster. Everyone looked at them before the season and said cup contender, right? Or, or playoff team at least, Yeah, you know, at least they'll make the playoffs. Um, And when they switched to Craig Brube, the team started playing like they should have. Now, here's here's the question I have. Is the Nashville roster, and, and it's so funny because, like, I want to include Phil Tomasino in that. Like, I want to include the, the available players. Are the available players good enough to win a playoff series? Yes or no? What do you think? If you were to get the players to play to their potential, would they win a playoff series? Yeah. I think so, right? Like, like Trennan, Janot, mm-hmm. Sizzens underperforming like crazy. You know, you're missing, you should have had Tolvin in there. Like you're missing these underperforming players. The, the top lines are underperforming as well. You know, I, you look at that. That's all a big deal. Okay. Uh, defensive core is actually pretty decent. You wish you had one more right-handed defenseman, but it is what it is. They're not a bad defensive core at all. When McDonough and Yossi were playing together, they looked great. All right. So take all of that. So to me, what you have to do is you have to look at all of that and say this, okay, you have the players that you think you can win a playoff round with. If that's the case, it might be worth a mid-season coaching change. If you looked at your roster and said, okay, you know what? Actually, this roster can't do it. We can't win a playoff series with these guys. Uh, I'd say just let it ride out. You know what I mean? Like just let it roll. Don't really think about it. But to me, with the roster being in the shape that it's in, I think that honestly, you've got to see if you can give it a shot. And that's going to take a coaching change, unfortunately, because I don't necessarily see things turning around because I think these players are kind of done with John Hines. I think that there's, and I tweeted this out, I think there's a shelf life on every NHL coach. Um, we mentioned John Cooper. There's a, like, he is like one of the few guys who continuously gets stuff out of his players, but he's like the only guy who has done that, that we can think of, you know, everyone else has a shelf life. They expire. Heinz has expired in Nashville. There needs to be a change. And, uh, man, it's, it's pretty wild. I want, let's go ahead. Let's talk general managers. If you were going to go out and find someone, you don't have to give a specific name, but who's somebody just like, if you were to write up a wish list, what are you looking for in a new general manager? I think somebody that has, Obviously a little bit younger, but um, a little a little bit more offensively minded. Somebody that can find a coach who can develop players in ways that Nashville has yet to been, be able to do. Um, obviously, Nashville can, can de- develop defensemen like it's nothing. But on the offensive side of the puck, they've got to get somebody that has the, the ability and the mindset to – know who to bring in and who can and 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 in terms of coaching even in scouting that can can get these players to actually develop in the minors and then come up here and develop even more in the nhl and produce at a high rate um and that's something nashville i think is missing uh but i think that would be the biggest thing and then finding somebody that actually kind of uh, they they need to be able to understand this the 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 landscape of Nashville too. I mean, obviously this is not this is not your 
Montreal or Toronto or New York Rangers or anything like that. So I think understand the fan base down here, but understand that the, the fans aren't, this is not a fan base anymore. Like it was that 10 years ago. That is, that's, that's okay with sitting back and just not doing well. We'll get to more on that in a second, by the way, we'll just touch on it. Um, I tend to agree with you entirely. Uh, I think understanding the market's a big deal. To me, I would try to go say, okay, what's a market that has won consistently, been successful in, in the playoffs consistently in a market similar, and say, who is somebody who has worked directly under that general manager who's seen how it's done? Um, and go give a guy a shot. You know, even if it's only a five-year shot, that doesn't work. At least you'll be bad enough to get some superstars, you know? And that, yeah. that's like, my thing is like, maybe take a risk to give yourself a chance to succeed. Uh, you know, maybe it's going and grabbing an assistant GM from Tampa or go like Sackick built that team from nothing. And at one point people were like, Sackick's an idiot. And now look at him. you know, like, like that was super successful. Maybe it's going and grabbing somebody from Colorado or, or, you know, Florida has built a beautiful team recently, you know, go look at what teams like that and say, who works for those guys who saw this process, who understands what it takes yeah. to build a team. Who's, who's made it work in Carolina, you yeah. know, and, and say, go grab a guy who's seen that. Um, who has a, a future minded hockey mind while letting it be traditional at the same time. And I don't have any names for you, but I'm not the guy who has to sit here and pull out names. You know, I'm not that guy. That's, they have people who are in charge of that. And that's, that's what I would say. I would, I would love to see. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. Um, I, I, you talked about the fans being, I, I want to spend like a second on this. Uh, Lindsay rally has done a really good job on the ballet crew here in Nashville for a long time. I mean, she's been here for years and years and years. Uh, she tweeted something after the loss against St. Louis and fans lost their minds on her. Um, and I think that, like you said, I think we're tired of losing. She, re people were, uh, a, a coach, she did an interview with one of the coaches who said Cole Smith is an 82 game player and all this. And, and it was really an irritating interview to watch as a Predators fan, especially in the circumstances of Illy Tolvanen. You know, like, it was just bad yeah. timing all the way around. And she tweeted, the replies on this interview are honestly cracking me up. The people who are criticizing have forgotten more about hockey than you will ever know, directing that at the fan base in Nashville. Yikes. Uh, how'd you take this, he this tweet, Heath? Yeah. Um, so I will say I didn't, I even, I kind of forgot about it. So my point earlier was not to tie into this, but it just happened. It happened that way. But yeah, this was something I think that just really irritated. A, I mean, a lot of, a lot of the Nashville Predator fan base, the ones especially that's been there for so long that put all this money into this team and season ticket holders and, and people who go and drive, you know, like you drive, I think what almost an hour to go to these hockey games and yeah, over an you hour. know parking and etc. And it's almost like yeah, I, you get it, the fan base, whatever. But and it's like they're just happy with where they're at, and the fan base. It's almost like well, we're going to get the you know the attention we want, the money we need to continue the franchise. But the fan base, I think, has completely lost their patience. Um, and it's like the the management and and I guess your TV crews and whatnot and, and announcers, they just are, they can't really, I don't know how to say it. They can't, you, you don't want them to talk completely. They don't, you don't need them to trash the organization, right? You don't want, that's not your goal, but I think they need to make realistic assumptions and not sit back and say, well, I mean, everything is fine when in reality, everything's not. Um, so that's kind of where I was at with it. It just was, it was an irritating kind of a, a realization of you're, you're not, 
it, it, it's not a realistic expectation for this fan base to be happy. No, no, you're totally, totally right. And that's, that's exactly, how I think a lot of people took it. And once again, Lindsay has done a great job for a long time, but that really struck a nerve with a lot of fans because we're sitting here saying, you want us to keep watching your broadcast type thing? Yeah. Do you want us like, Hey, maybe if your broadcast was more in like, like educational, we know more, you know what I mean? Like it was just, it didn't, it didn't sit well with a lot of fans at all, but um, she did put out an apology for that. Uh, I didn't think it was worth an apology. I mean, she oh, I don't think, I mean, yeah, I don't really care. I mean, it didn't bother me any, I just thought it was interesting. Um, but we've, you know, we've always said that the hometown, at least in Nashville, the hometown broadcast is always super biased towards Nashville. And like that, they, which they is feel, they feel very intertwined with the team like they yeah, feel like and, they and can't separate themselves no and they, they can't call out things that are happening negatively yeah um which i don't care for but at the same time they do have a job to do so let them do their job and oh well but no i, did, I didn't really think it was that big of a deal um the uh i i watched the other team's broadcasts uh just because it's you learn more about the other teams when you're watching their broadcast and uh and Colorado's was such a joy and a breath of fresh air uh, last night. It really was. It was so good. So good. All right. Uh, I want us to hit a few Twitter questions real quick because um, because I, I thought these are awesome. And if you're watching and ever have a question for the podcast, feel free to tweet it in. I know we've already hit on Josh's. Here's Jacob Reed. He said, any teams near the ha- as teams near the halfway point, who's selling, who's buying, which acquisitions need to be made? Um, this was an interesting one for me because I sat here and, and I kind of, I thought about it right now. I don't think there are a lot of teams that are real focused on buying. I think that there are several teams who could sell. I think Chicago is definitely going to be a seller. Um, mm-hmm. You know, I'm going to be very interested to see if Taze and Kane go somewhere. Uh, yeah. if, it, it, that'll be an expensive move for a good team, but if Chicago can retain for the year or whatever, you know, that could be huge for a team and those guys are expensive. So Chicago could get a lot back. I, I'd be very interested there. You know, I'm interested to see if San Jose sells um, I, Anaheim. I don't think it's going to sell a lot. Maybe a few of their older players. Uh, you know, th- there are some teams like that where you're like, I expect them to sell, but uh, buyers it's hard. I think for teams to buy right now, um, the one yeah. team that I think is definitely going to buy, we've already spent a lot of time on him. Edmonton, I think is going to buy. I think they're going to go buy a defenseman and I think they're going to go buy a goaltender. Um, they shouldn't need a goaltender. They're an awkward goaltender spot, but I think if they could flip one of their goalies to go upgrade big time and get a, a guy out of a team that isn't doing too well, I think that they would love 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 to do something like that even if it's like a craig anderson out of buffalo who's had a great year somehow is is doing things that no goalie of his his age should do but also has made playoff runs and could do something i I don't know i just threw anderson out there i don't know if that's the type of guy they're gonna go try to get um you know I, i don't know that that is the team that i really wonder about as a buyer and then I don't know those that's the, and then I imagine some of those other top teams will try to buy as well, but did you have any sellers or buyers that you could think of? I mean, honestly, it was about the same. I mean, it's, it, I'm still at the point, obviously you can kind of, you, you kind of know who's going to make playoffs right now or can uh, a few teams, you can make the assumption. So who could buy, but like you're saying, it's, it's hard to, it's really hard to buy right now. Um, I mean, the, the buying aspect of it with the way the salary cap is and yeah. I mean, a lot of teams are brushing up against the salary cap, but it's just almost impossible. Um, yep. And then the selling aspect. Yeah. I think Chicago obviously is a big one. Um, a team that, that this, it's going to be tough, I think, to move, move them unless they retain a similar salary. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I mean, about the same, I think Edmonton tries to do something somewhere near the deadline in terms of buying, uh, they may be able to get a goaltender. Um, you'd mentioned Anderson. Actually, I don't think that would be bad for him really. Um, 
he can do so he he can do something. It's just dependent of I think a lot on how much he's going to have to how much he ends up playing through the rest of the season. Yeah, um, at his age. So, yeah. but yeah, I I agree. No, I I think I, I still don't think I'm far enough into the season to full on label who's going to sell. Um, maybe yeah. once at the end of the December here, once we get into January, maybe the first week of January, you'd really figure that out. Um, but yeah, I, I think right what you'd mentioned was right on. I would not be shocked if the Panthers are in a playoff spot and pushing come trade deadline to see them go out and try to add a big piece with the best they can. Um, but they're also short on prospects. All right, here's another Twitter question that I, I thought was, was pretty pretty good. Uh, if you ha- What do you think about the Devils? They're on a five-game losing streak, and many people say their schedule was a, litty, a little easy starting uh, off the season. That's from Ryan Hartman Truther rip to him being in Nashville, by the way. Um, but what do you think about that, uh, about the New Jersey Devils right now? They obviously had a really fun start to the season, but like you said, they've lost five in a row, uh, five in a row. Um, they still lead the Metro. Uh, so what do you think about the Devils? Yeah, I mean, fun fact, the Devils lost to the National Predators, but <laughs> that was obviously earlier Yeesh. before Nashville took a major... 180 um but no the devils i just think they're they're giving up a lot of goals um i mean their lowest game that they've lost in terms of score was two to one against philly um otherwise they've been and they're in their losses now they've they've given up new york islanders six to four four three rangers four one dallas two one philly and then four two florida they're giving up a lot of goals, which is a problem, um, obviously. But, but I hate – you know, they're, they're actually decently getting scoring too. Um, but I, I really think on the backside of their puck right now, on the defensive side, they're obviously not performing as well as they should be. Because um, you should be winning games against the Islanders if you score four goals. Yeah. I mean, that, I, that should be a win. You should be beating Philly. You know – you say their schedule is easy to start out the year, and it and it wasn't. It I don't wasn't think it like, was horribly it, easy. It, it was wasn't. it was easier than what they have right now for sure. Um, but yeah, I I will say this: it's not like they've had a cakewalk schedule. You know, they're winning yeah. games. They're winning games that are in front of them. That's the old mantra, right? You know, they they go against Carolina, Florida. Those are tough games. Boston, Boston again. Pittsburgh. I mean, like these are tough games at this point though, if they go 500 through some of these games, they're going to be fine. I mean, they're, they're, yeah. they're so, so far up there when it comes to the standings that they should be, they should be in decent shape. And, uh, and that that's kind of what I would say about the New Jersey devils. All right. We'll close the show. Um, on on this one, Heath, let's let's do a minute each on this one. This is from uh oh man, I dude, I cannot pronounce your Twitter handle. Uh so I'm so sorry. Uh but it's maybe talk a little bit about the ducks and the sharks, how they both went from cup contenders four or five years ago to two of the worst teams in the league. Uh, real, well, I'm gonna be quick on this oh. one. I'll let you be quick on it as well. Uh I think that this is a situation just of you know what? their stars aged out and you, when you're, when you're cup contender, cup contender, cup contender, cup contender, it's hard to restock the cupboard. So almost all teams that were really good for a lot of years go through this. And I think that's just kind of where they are right now for both of those teams. Would you agree? Yeah, completely. I mean, you, you think about the ducks, obviously you had back when they won the cup, they had Jaguar as their goaltender. They had uh, Solani in there, I think still, um, and then as they yeah. progress, they've pulled, yeah, Paul Korea, Corey Perry. But then you look at the Sharks, they had obviously Joe. Wait, Thornton. were you talking about 07 or? I'm talking all the way up from 07, not okay, just cool, 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 that cool. one year. Um, yep. All the way up until now, essentially. Korea would have been gone um, in 07. Korea would have so. been gone, way gone. Yeah. Cause, yeah. But uh, no, even from even going all the way up till now, they had obviously Corey Perry and all them, um, NBX and whatnot. But that yeah, the Sharks too. Joe Thornton, Patrick Marlowe, everybody—they just aged out. That's all it yep. is. Except for Joe Pavelski, who's 
he is it out in Dallas right now. Ageless yeah. wonder, ageless wonder, truly. Yeah. Um, but that that's what I would say to that. All right, Heath, this is a beast of a show. We recorded for a long time, but lots to talk about. And uh, we're going to go to the game tomorrow night. And anything, I'm sure a lot of listeners won't maybe see this until tomorrow or the day after, but like anything you want to see in uh, in Nashville tomorrow night? I just want to see some, uh, some goals. I mean, the more than one would be nice. Um, there's just a, a little bit of competing. I mean, I don't really care if they lose. That's not what I, I don't really care. As long as they put up a decent fight and actually play well, I'll be pretty happy. But Heath, Nashville loses to Edmonton. They lose to Chicago. They lose to Colorado. Does John Hines get fired on December 26th? Because I doubt Poyle will do it before Christmas. Yeah, if probably they, not. That'd be kind of if, rude. If they um, lose the next three, would they fire John Hines on the day after Christmas? Part, uh, part of me wants to say yes, but I don't think they will. Interesting. That would be nine games in I, a row. You think would. they've got to get to 10? Because if they lose nine, they're not beating Dallas. No. But I mean, they don't have like a – the thing is they don't have a really large, you know, like a, a winter classic or something coming up. So would it shock me if he did? No. Not at all. It, would, it wouldn't shock me if he, if he fired him. But I don't think he will. We'll see. We'll see. All righty. Heath, thank you for joining us. This is, uh, as always, guys – Thank you for listening, Um, but this is a good one. Good to be here. Thank you so much again for being here for today's episode. As always, if you don't mind hitting the share button, that would be huge for this podcast to grow and to continue to grow. Share it with your Predators fan friend. Share it with your Oilers fan friend. Share it with whoever you are a fan of. Uh, If you don't mind, if you're on YouTube, hitting the subscribe button. We are so close to a 1,000 subscribers. I would love to get there so soon. So if you don't mind clicking that subscribe button, that would mean a ton to us. Thank you again for watching or listening, and we'll see you next time.